Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in today's first video. We're looking at more analogues for the summer uh, for today's first video. Later on, we're going to have the gas weather this Sunday round. That'll be with you around lunchtime. Uh, so, have a bit of an eclectic mix uh, with that one. And then, as we go through into this scene, I think we're going to have to update Snow Watch, would you believe? Because although we're coming to the end of April, uh, we're going to have a really potent northerly wind over the next two or three days. And uh, I think better have a look and see what the wintry potential is with that. So a lot going on at Gasworth is today. Keep checking back for more. But as I say, to, uh, the first video today is going to be having a look at some more summer analogues. We did the first analogues update last week, which was focusing specifically on ENSO and the impacts that might have for the summer uh, today's analogues package is actually going to be looking at um, warm marches. Our good friend James Acryl has been trawling through the analogues to come up with summers that followed a warm march, because we have had a warm march for uh, 2017. And I'll talk you through all of the research right now. But as I said, I'm going to start off with a little bit more about uh, last week, about the um, ENSO summers. So uh, this table that James has sent through to us is sort of going over what we talked about uh, last week. So we looked specifically at the La Nina to El Nino uh, summers. And these are all of the summers uh, just here, all of the years just there. Uh, and we've got some pretty warm summers in that analogs package as well. I mean, we've got 1899, um, which has a summer anomaly of 1.8 degrees above average. These are the monthly CETs and anomalies uh, just there. And then that's the actual summer CET and summer anomaly just there. So 1899 was a warm summer. Look, all three summer months coming out with uh, strongly positive deviations. And uh, the actual summer anomaly itself was around 1.8 degrees, 2 degrees above average. You also got 1911 in that analogues package. Uh, and again, that was another very warm summer, particularly uh, hot in July and August. Summer anomaly, again, significantly above average. And then we've got the daddy, the daddy of the hot summers, really, is 1976, which has that phenomenally warm uh, June with a CT of 17 degrees, 2.5 degrees above average. July anomaly in 76, 18.7, 2.7 degrees above average. Then August a little bit lower in terms of the anomaly. That only happened because we had some unusually cold nights during August 1976 because the, the ground was so dry by that point, we were virtually going into a desert type climate with sort of cold nights but really hot days. The overall summer CT anomaly was uh, 2.3 degrees above average in 1976. Now, if we look at all the uh, summers uh, together and uh, we look at those summers that are warm and average first of all, and we're going to say around half a degree above average, half a degree or more above average, we come out with one two, three, and four of those uh, summers. If we look at summers that are half a degree or more below average, we have just two. We have uh, 1972, which is the coldest Nino to Nino summer, that one just there. And then the only other one really is 1965, which has um, an anomaly of nearly one degree uh, below average. So, We've got four summers that are half a degree or more above average. And then we've got uh, two summers, half, uh, that are uh, half a degree or more below average. And then for average summers, which is anywhere around half a degree, either above or below average, we've got one, two, uh, three, and four of those summers. So I think we can say that the Nina to Nino summers probably do have a slight uh, tendency to be warmer. So let's say they're more likely to be average to warmer than average than they are to be average to colder than average. So it is, it's not a strong signal, but there is a signal there, I think, for those uh, Nina to Nino summers to be on the warmer side of things. That wasn't all we looked at, though, because we also looked at La Nina to Enso neutral uh, summers. Only two of those, 1917 and 2012. Um, and in terms of the summer anomalies, quite interestingly, because 1917 comes out slightly mild than average, whereas uh, 2012 comes out slightly 
cooler than average. So not a great deviation, really, between either of those summers. But I think the main thing about those summers was rainfall. 2012 was a very wet summer from start to finish. 1917 started off quite dry and very warm. You see the June anomaly there is over one degree above average, but it very rapidly went down the tubes, and it finished up really cool and wet uh, in August of 1917. I just recently did the historic uh, video about that uh, summer, of course. And then finally, last week, we looked at the uh, failed La Ninas, because although we just about managed to get a La Nina in place for the winter of 2016, 2017. It's a very close run thing. It's basically a failed La Nina. So James looked at uh, failed La Ninas going through to uh, Enzo Neutral and then El Nino. Three of those summers, which is 1957, 2006, 2014. They're all warmer than average, but um, two of them, 1957 and 2014, are only ever so slightly above average. They're basically average summers whereas 2006 of course was a was a hot summer what is interesting about those three summers though is that they are all to varying degrees cool in uh august they all have quite poor august following uh warm or hot june and july's so a bit of a mixed bag really but i think the strongest signal is with those nina to nino summers which i think are to some degree anyway favoring uh, favouring slightly warmer than average uh, summer. So if we go into um, if we go into a uh, El Nino during this summer, following on from the La Nina that took place in winter, it is possible that that will slightly favour a warmer summer. And we can see that within that there are some really quite hot options. Eighteen ninety nine, uh, nineteen seventy six, and the other one of course nineteen eleven. Right, let's get on uh, with, I'm not sure quite what went wrong there, so let's pull that back a bit, there we go. Uh, let's get on with today's, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, let's get on with uh, today's analogue then, and we're looking at warm marches. So this is the uh, March 2017 mean temperature anomaly set against 61 to 90 from the UK Met Office. It was a warm March. We had anomalies throughout the whole country above average, but particularly so for England and Wales, where it's around 2 to 3 three degrees uh, above average. In terms of the central temperature, ah, that's what went wrong. I've just zoomed in on the CT. So in terms of the central England temperature for uh, March um, 2017, it came out 8.7, which was three degrees uh, above average. So obviously it was a very warm uh, month in uh, March 2017. What impact could that have then on uh, on our summer fate. So James has had a look back through the archives and uh, he's come up with all of the uh, years that have March CETs of around a couple of degrees above average. So we start off in the package with uh, 1938 and uh, that summer was actually very unsettled. So we had a warm March in 1938 but the summer itself really unsettled. Trough centred right over the top of the country, a ridge through the central part of the Atlantic, and the flow was going something like that. So that was a very unsettled summer, poor summer in 1938, following on from that uh, very warm March. Into our second year, that's 1945, again, lots of unsettled uh, summer in 1945 with low pressure close to the country, slightly different in its position though. And uh, it was hot at times, actually, particularly July, I think, um, 1945, BE uh, month, of course. Uh, I think July 1945 um, was uh, really quite a warm uh, month, to be honest. So uh, we have a cool and unsettled summer back in 1938. 1945 is also... Uh, is also uh, unsettled summer, but it's quite a lot cooler. 1948 is our next summer, following on from the warm March, and this one looks really, really unsettled. Look at this, low pressure, very deep trough, centred through, not just the Atlantic, but many parts of Europe as well. The jet stream 
and that, that trough extends right way back into America. That's quite an extraordinary looking uh, chart, really. Uh, we've got the jet stream coming through like that as well. And we've got northern blocking hints up there. That would have been, I haven't looked at the stats in 948, but that would have been really quite an atrocious uh, summer by the look of it. There would have been a lot of heavy rain in with that as well. Our next summer, following on from a warm March, is 1957. Deep trough again around many northern and western parts of Europe. A ridge blocking uh, close to uh, Greenland there. And uh, again, the jet stream is on a southerly track. So again, that one looks like a poor summer. Had a decent June in 1957. And this one does crop up with our Enso years as well, remember. Uh, so it had a Poor, had a decent June, but oh, it was a poor summer. It certainly deteriorated, a bit of a front-loaded summer. Okay, at the start, but then turned very unsettled later on. So far, it looks like warm marches tend to be followed by uh, poor summers. Our next year is 1961. That one has a ridge down to our south. Deep trough is up to the north, bringing the jet stream through. So, again, that one looks like quite an unsettled summer, although the Azores highs are displaced a little bit further north. So, not as bad as some of the summers, I wouldn't have thought, that we've been looking at, at least for the south anyway, there would have been a reasonable amount of dry weather. Our next summer is 1981, and this is rather different to anything that we've seen before. The trough is centred over Scandinavia and Central Europe during this summer, with a ridge out to our west. And uh, we would have been doing something a bit like that with the uh, flow. So uh, 1981 was an unusual summer, really, in that it was quite a dry summer, but it's also quite a cool summer. And cool and dry in summer is a rare combination. Generally, you'll either have it cool and wet in summer, or you'll have it hot and dry. So to get a cool but dry summer, quite unusual. Uh, would have been a lot of quiet weather with this ridge displaced to our west, but the flow would have been very often from the north or northwest. I think August was, was a little bit better uh, in 1981. Uh, and then we've got 1990, and this was coming out with quite a surprising uh, uh, anomaly, actually, it's showing a trough up to the northwest and extending through the Norfolk country, a ridge down to the south, uh, and the flow would have been going something a little bit like that. So uh, it looks like that would be a poor summer in 1990, but we know actually that was a very hot summer, um, uh, or at least it became very hot. June was quite unsettling. That's probably what's skewering that anomaly a little bit, because June... Uh, 1990 was quite a cool, unsettled month. But then we went through to July and August. It rapidly improved, culminating in that very hot spell that set up through the second half of July and the first half of August. So, as ever with these anomalies, you do have to bear in mind they are free monthly anomalies. They don't tell you the full story all the time. And that's a good case in point, I think, for 1990, because you would look at that and think it's a very poor summer, possibly. But actually, we know 1990 was one of our hottest summers. 1991, again, it's a little bit similar in that the anomaly looks quite unsettled. And again, there was a pretty cool, or a very cool, uh, June. It's one of the coolest Junes of the 20th century, actually, in 1991. And quite unsettled too. Later on, though, there's a rapid improvement. So, particularly in uh, into the second half of July and through August, and even into September of 1991, a lot of dry and quite hot weather uh, was going on then in uh, 1991. So again, those two anomalies, 1990, 1991, they look like they're quite poor summers. Actually, they were good summers, but had slightly uh, dodgy starts. 1997 is in there as well as a summer that follows a very warm March. And uh, this one, again, it looks like it's possibly quite an unsettled summer, although we have got this big ridge here up over Scandinavia, which eventually produced a very hot month in August of 1990. So as we go on to these more modern 
um, as going on to these more modern summers, I think what might be becoming apparent is that they tend to be quite poor to start off with, all three of those summers, 1990, 1991, 1997, all quite poor at the start, and then getting much, much hotter uh, later on. So possibly we might, following this warm uh, warm March that we've had, it might possibly be a signal for something hotter to happen in uh, August. 1998 is our next uh, summer, a lot from the 1990s. It looks like the 1990s were a very warm uh, decade in terms of marches. And this one was just a classic cool uh, summer. It wasn't overly wet, but it was a very cool, unsettled uh, type summer with uh, an odd-looking pattern of ridging out to our west. This is another of those, uh, uh, this is another El Nino to La Nina summer as well, uh, so it looks like it's quite a, a quite a odd looking pattern with this trough here centered across northern Europe uh, and it wasn't overly wet, but it was generally quite a cool summer and then our last summer is two thousand and twelve, which we know again this shows up in the analogs package for the enso years we know it was a very poor summer, really wet, really cool, lots of blocking around Greenland and that trough under neath it and the flow going something like that so that's sort of the years back to 1938 all of the summers that follow on uh, from warm marches uh, again we've got a little bit of a, a little table uh, here to look at and I think overall again it is a signal possibly for uh, a warmer summer so very similar to uh, the table we looked at before, we've got our years on the side, we've got our monthly CTs and anomalies up there, and then we've got our summer CTs and anomalies just there. We actually go back to 1734 uh, with this one, um, and uh, we'll concentrate though on the years from 1938, uh, I think. So uh, there's a long gap from 1822 to 19. Uh, 38, quite interestingly, for these uh, summers following on from very warm marches, showing us that uh, really warm marches were quite uncommon, to say the least, through the 1800s. I'm off on a bit of a tangent on that. So uh, let's have a look at the summer tables then. And uh, you can see that we've got uh, many of these tables are showing up uh, yellow. Uh, but most of these summers are actually within half a degree of average. So remember, for uh, a proper warm or cool summer, we're looking at summers, uh, CETs, around either half a degree or more above average or half half a degree or more below average. And there aren't all that many of them, uh, actually. So from 1938, we've only got... Uh, we've only got that year there, which is 1990, of course, the hot August, and then 1997, that are uh, hot summers, genuinely warm summers. The rest of them are just coming out very, very close to average. And we have got some quite cool summers as well, 1961, for example, 1981. They're within half a degree of average, so you would say, really, they're just around average, but they are on uh, the cooler side. And, of course, we've got 2012, which also so comes out uh, just over half a degree cooler uh, than average. Going back beyond 1938, uh, well, we've got 1779 there, which looks quite uh, quite a hot summer, uh, around 1.2 degrees above average. Otherwise, again, many of these years are coming out quite close to average. What about the overall uh, monthly anomalies, though? So I think the column that has the most blue in it, certainly from 1938, is probably June uh, with one, two, three, four and five. That's 1991, by the way, an anomaly uh, in June 1991, two degrees below average, really cold month and 2012 just there. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six uh, Junes back to 1938 are really quite cool uh, following on from the warm March. Whereas if we look at August, again, we'll choose 1938 as our starting point, which is just there. We've got one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, and seven 
August that are coming out uh, really quite warm. And there are some very hot August in there. Uh, 1997, for example, 2.7 degrees above average. And of course, 1990, 2.2 degrees above average. 1991, very warm as well, 1.3 degrees above average. So it looks like, perhaps uh, if we take the more modern years, anyway, it looks like... Uh, the summers that follow on from a warm March, they tend to be quite close to average overall, not huge deviations in most of these summers overall, but you have to drill down to a month by month, take it month by month, and it looks like they tend to be cooler in June, and then potentially quite warm in August. That's something that appears to be showing up there uh, with these years. T particularly the more modern years, tending to be warmer in August. The overall uh, anomaly for these summers, following on from the warm March, looks very unsettled with that deep trough over the top of the country and hints of quite a lot of northern blocking as well. That's all years combined from 1938 down to 2012. But I think the table is more interesting, really, than the overall uh, all years combined, uh, height anomaly, because it does tell us that although overall these summers, they don't tend to deviate greatly from average, one or two do, but most of them don't deviate greatly from average, but between the months, if you look at it on a month-by-month -month basis, it looks as though they start off, particularly more modern years, quite cool, and they finish up potentially quite hot. So possibly we could be looking, a long while since we had a hot August, you have to go back to 2003 since we had a really hot uh, August which had a central temperature of over 18 degrees. Quite a long time since we had a hot August. It might be that we are looking more towards a warmer month um, this uh, warmer August this summer. But then you look at the ENSO stuff, and that might go against that a little bit to some degree also. So we're going to put all this together in the end. All these analogues will be put together uh, with the long-range models. We're talking of the long-range models. We have the second um, season model around it for the summer uh, coming up at Gazo this next Sunday, a week today. Uh, we're going to put it all together in the end. And uh, we'll see what we can come up with. And that will be at the end of May when we release the Gazzo of its summer 2017 forecast. James has, uh, I know James is beavering away right now looking at uh, April's, dry April's, to add to all of this. And uh, we'll be examining that research uh, early next month. Right, this video is going to be placed on the Summer Updates and Forecast page. There'll be a written post that goes with it as well. So uh, you can come back and watch the video whenever you want, and you'll be able to read that written summary, which will be posted up uh, probably this evening, because I've got a lot to be getting on with uh, today at Gaz Weathers. But it will be posted up at some point today. Uh, over lunch, we're going to have Gaz Weathers study roundup, and then uh, late this afternoon, this evening, I think we're going to do Snow Watch. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.